It's all good. I love you, Mike. Have a hand for Mike and the band. It was Christmas, 1995. There was snow outside. There was a fire crackling in the fireplace. The tree was adorned with beautiful ornaments. My parents are here. They can attest to it. They put on a beautiful Christmas for us kids. And then there was all of our favorite part of Christmas. You know, the presents, right? There were small presents, big presents, medium-sized presents. And then... There was the present, you know, the creme de la creme of presents, the present that your parents make you wait till the very end after opening all the other presents to open. Well, that year for me, I ripped back the the wrapping paper and I found a brand new, green, beautiful, huff, tough boy bike. It was beautiful. It was my first bike, uh, no training wheels, uh, my own bike. That bike didn't know the speed and the ramps and the jumps that it had coming its way. But in the midst of basking in the glory of my new bike, I hear my brother's voice cry out to me, can I try it? Seriously? So I did what any responsible older brother would have done. I punched him and told him to get his own. <laughs> it was obvious that day that I had a sharing problem. And I think if we have to be honest with ourselves today, we all have sharing problems, don't we? There's just something about sharing, sharing our possessions, sharing our things that's just tough. It's just tough to let those things go because there's security in that. It makes us feel good and warm to have our own things. Sharing takes risk. It takes faith. It makes us vulnerable to share. But we come to a question, a question such as bread, and we know, we already know the answer. We know in our hearts that the answer to the question of bread, that the kingdom of God, that the church has to answer, is that we have to share our bread. We have to share. We just simply know that that's the right thing to do. And before we go much further, I think we need to understand the ancient first century concept of bread. See, bread was the staple food in the first century. It was the basis of their diet. When people went off uh, to work, they didn't go home to bring home the bacon, but they went to bring home the bread. Bread was a symbol for food, and it was a sustainer uh, of physical life. And when people were crying out for these things, when people were praying for these things, they were praying for this. They were praying for their physical life to be sustained. We know, too, though, that praying and crying out for bread is not just a first century phenomenon and experience. I mean, Josh talked about it in his sermon. How we hear the cry of people praying for bread, of crying out to have us help them in their time of need, those who are less fortunate to them. And we know that our response to, as the church has to be that we need to share our bread. But why? Why? Why do we need to share our bread? Because sometimes it's just so hard. I mean, we resonate with guys like Francis Chan as Christians. We, we resonate with his story. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, but um, in, in his very popular book, Crazy Love, he decided to give away all of the proceeds of that book, and there were quite a few proceeds. It was very popular. He gave away all of those proceeds to the poor, to the hungry, to the sick, to the victims of human sex slave trafficking, He gave it all away. Surprisingly, when people got wind of this, some some of them responded negatively. They criticized him. Even Christians did this. They said, Francis, I mean, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Giving away all of that money that God's blessed you with? 
Surely you should keep a little bit, a little bit back, you know, just in case an emergency happens to you or your family and you can't work and things like that. Surely you could save it for an emergency. And Francis responded with, are you kidding me? How, how is it not an emergency that children are dying daily because they don't have enough food? How is it not an emergency that children get raped every day of their life? How is that not an emergency and why are we not doing something about it? As the church, we know, we know that our answer to a question such as bread is that we have to share the bread that we have. My beautiful wife, Chelsea, I think understands the importance of sharing our bread. It, it's so amazing to see how passionate she is about hospitality and sharing in that way. And I'm convinced that there's going to be more people in the kingdom of heaven because of the way Chelsea shares in hospitality than I ever could do preaching. We know that the question such as bread, our response has to be that we share, but why? But why? It takes such risk, it takes such faith. It requires so much of us to share. Our question today is not what we need to do, but why we need to do it. And if there is a story in the New Testament that would answer our question, I think it would be an important enough story to include it in all four Gospels. And in fact, this story does. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And today we're going to look at that story in John's account, in John chapter 6. You can open there and follow along with me, or if you'd just like to listen along, um, it's whatever you would like to do. But John chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says this. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, well, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have just one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled, filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over after those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Such a beautiful story, isn't it? Such a beautiful story, and I'm drawn to this story for so many reasons. I'm drawn to this story for one, it's just a great miracle of Jesus. We're able to see the great power and glory of God through what Jesus did in the feeding of the 5,000 from five barley loaves and two small fish. It's a great miracle of God this story, but that's not what only drives, draws me to this story. I'm also drawn to this story because, man, this is theologically rich. Holy cow. 
I, I don't know if you noticed in the context, but I think it's important that we pay attention to it. And it's around Passover time. And around Passover time, Jesus goes up on a mountain. And around the time that Jesus is up on the mountain, he feeds a group of traveling people bread. Now, if I remember right, from my 8 a.m. Woody Wilkinson OT history class, I didn't get a holla. That's ancient OT history for, or ancient Israel of history, whatever it is now. Uh, but if I remember right from that class, it was Moses that around the time of the first Passover went up on a mountainside And around that time, after going up on the mountainside to get the law, God fed a group of traveling people bread in the desert. See, what I think John's doing is he's aligning the character of Moses with that of Jesus in the New Testament. He's saying Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the anti-type of what Moses was. And it's no wonder, with such a context as this, that the people who were fed that day turn to each other and say, dude, this guy is the prophet. You know, the one that would come after Moses, who who would help restore Israel. This is the prophet. And not only do they call him prophet, but they try and make him king. I don't find this surprising either, because so far Jesus looks like a pretty good candidate. I mean, he's done great miraculous activities. He's had a great following. And on this day, he does one of the most central activities there are to being king. He provides the people following him bread. Their physical resources. Their sustaining of life. He provides that for them. And they see this, and the text says that they try and make him king by force, literally by seizing. And Jesus' response is to flee, is to get out. Because he wants the people to know that yes, he may be a king, and yes, he provides food, but he's not that kind of king. His kingdom is bigger than they ever imagined it to be. Not only would it fully restore Israel and Jerusalem to its place of prominence, But just like Josh talked about in the kingdom, it was to restore the entire world. And I'm drawn to the story because of that. But that's not what it, that's not what is it that draws me to the story. I'm drawn to the story most by the most unlikely of characters. Drawn to the story by the little boy. The little boy that John is specific to mention has five barley loaves and two small fish. Barley loaves were not normal size loaves of bread. They were smaller. They were the food of the poor. They were more like, like a little cracker. Two, sar- two small sardines. It's the food of the poor. And this little boy who has nothing and probably doesn't even know where his next meal is going to come from after these five small loaves of bread and two fish. But he comes to Jesus with the ramen noodles of the ancient world. You understand that as college kids, being poor college kids. He brings the ramen noodles of the ancient world, and he says, I'd like to help. I'd like to help. And the text is specific to mention that Jesus asked the question of how are we gonna feed all of these people after all? He asked that to test his disciple. I don't know what kind of test it was. Maybe it was an organizational test, like they had to organize all this food to be distributed. Maybe it, it was a leadership test or a faith test that they had to trust in Jesus. I don't know what kind of test it was, but I do know this the little boy passed the test. He passed the test because he came to Jesus and he shared his bread. That he believed in Jesus. And what he experienced, he would never forget. Because what he experienced, I think is described later in John, John chapter 6, 
starting in verse 25, when it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, the crowd had followed Jesus to the other side after he had walked on water, minor detail, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? The work of God is this, Jesus replies, is to believe in the one he has sent. And in verse 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. The boy experienced the living bread because he shared the only bread that he had. Why? Why do we share our bread? Because the only way to experience Jesus, the only way to experience the living bread is to share the only bread we have. It's why we share. It's why we share. And if we're going to understand that we need to share our bread, we have to understand what kind of bread we truly have. When we think of bread, uh, I've said it already earlier, we think of the physical resources that we have, the supplies, the goods that we're able to share. We think of these things, and I think we're right in thinking about that. We're right in considering that God wants us to share those things. But I think the issue is still bigger than that. It's still bigger than just our physical resources. I think the issue goes back to how we view grace. Grace, God's grace. When we think of grace, we think of God's unmerited favor. The unmerited favor that he bestowed upon us to save us. And that's true, but God's grace is much bigger than simply that. God's grace changes us, and it changes how we live. See, for God, there's a direct connection between his grace that he bestows to us and how he expects us to live out being his people, being his community, doing things with what we've been given. See, I think that's why in Romans chapter 12, Verses 1 and 2, that Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of what? God's mercy, God's grace, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's grace that propels us to be different. It's grace that propels us to be God's people as he originally intended us to be. That's why, too, I think we hear Paul's famous words in Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no man may boast. And then there's the connection for. For we are what? For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Could it be that God's grace is bigger than we ever imagined? That it's God's grace and his grace alone that saves us, but it's God's grace that propels us to do something with what we've been given, the bread that we've been given, the resources, the gifts, the abilities that we have. Could it be that it's by God's grace that we get to wake up at 7 a.m. and go to classes at Ozark Christian College just so that we get to learn more about the truths of God so that we might be able to explain them better? Or, Or could it be by God's grace that we get to do papers where we're taught to think more fully and completely about God? 
Could it be by God's grace that you worship ministers, get to practice hours on end, instruments sometimes that you don't like, hours on end practicing these so you get to lead the community of God in times of worship before the throne? Could it be by grace? Could it be by God's grace that God gives us money and our physical resources just so that we can give them away? Could it be by God's grace that we get to spend hours slaving over our sermons and our lessons just so that we're able to proclaim Jesus is king more clearly? Could it be by God's grace that we even get to share in the sufferings of Christ so that we may know him more? If it is, then share it. Share your bread. Share what you have. If you have money, then share it and give it away. If you have songs of praise, then share it when you sing and leading others in singing about them. If you have a Twitter, then share it when you tweet about it. If you have a Facebook, then share it when you update about it. And if you have a message that Jesus is king and that he's here with the kingdom and he loves everybody and he wants everybody to be a part of the kingdom, then preach it. Preach it and tell everybody about it in every opportunity that you have, either until you run out of breath or Jesus himself comes back and takes you home. Share your bread. Because the only way to experience the living bread is to share the only bread that you have. I have one more story and I'll be done. It was my freshman year at OCC, week of E, and I was on the wilderness challenge that you can take in a substitution um, for the spiritual formation class. And I think we might have a picture. Do we have uh, a picture? Um, During the trip, we got to do a bunch of crazy adventure things like canoeing and hiking and rock climbing and caving, all those fun things. And then at the end of every day, We went back to this. This was our home, depending on what spot we were in. We got a tarp, a few strings, a mat to lay under us, and a a bed that we laid down on. And that's what we stayed under, whether it was raining or a starry night. And I remember one night, towards the end of the trip, we were all tired, and we were late getting into camp, and... uh, and we were late, and so we hurried, uh, we hurried to put up our tent, our tarp that you saw there, and um, we had some supper, had a quick devotional thought, and then we all went to bed. And I remember sleeping so well that night, being so tired, and then in the middle of the night, I was woken up by rain hitting my tarp, And I got up and realized that I was still dry, I was still warm, I was okay. But then I heard a cry out in the distance, help, we're all wet, we're all wet. The girls, when they put their tarp up, they put it up and it was leaking on them that night. And They were crying out, Chaz, come help us, we're all wet. All right, so I sit up in my sleeping bag and I, kind of come to my senses a little bit, still groggy, and I, I hear their cry for help. And it's not my proudest moment, but I remember sitting up and feeling around me and realizing how comfortable and how dry and how warm I was. And like, I'm not sharing my help with you. And so I laid back down and kind of dozed back up to sleep. <laughs> But just so you know, somebody else came and they, <laughs> they shared their help with the girls. And I too, once I realized somebody else was doing it, thought I better get up too. I got up. But I realized that night on that trip that I had an opportunity to share my bread, to share my help with somebody who needed it. I passed it up. And that night, it was, it was just water, and they were just a little wet, and they were just a little hurt. But in my life, there's been far too many people who have needed my help more than those girls on that night. What have I done? I've just stayed in my warm sleeping bag and chose not to share the bread that God had given me. <laughs>
happens. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's raining outside. And Jesus is calling us to partner with him in doing something about it. He's calling us to share our bread. Because the only way to experience the living bread is to share the only bread you have. You're dismissed. Go share your bread.